Welcome to the lecture on mathematical finance. After we have discussed uh, the notions of stochastic processes, filtrations and stopping times, we will now focus on probability measures. More precisely, I would like to introduce and discuss the notion of absolutely continuous measures and densities. But let us have a closer look at these objects. So let us start with an example. So it's, a, it's a kind of trivial example. So I would like to consider a stochastic process, which I denote by x, and you see it only consists of two time points, meaning the index set just contains the value 0 and 1. And this stochastic process is, as usual, defined on our, our favorite probability space, omega fp. And I would like to assume that this process starts at time 0 in 1. Moreover, I would like to assume that the process at time 1 either jumps to the value 2, and this he does with probability 1 half, or he jumps to the position 1 half. So clearly we can compute the expectation of x1 in that example. It is simply uh, 5 quarter. Why? Well, simply compute 1 half times 2, it's 1, plus a 1 half times 1 half, it's 1 quarter. 1 plus 1 quarter is 5 quarter. So, and you see this 5 quarter strictly larger than 1, and that's the value at x0. And um, for reasons which will be clear later on in the lecture, um, let me formulate the following task. Is it pro possible to come up with a new probability measure, let's call it Q, on our measurable space omega f, which has the following properties, namely that the probability uh, of the event uh, um, x1 equal to 2 and x1 equal to 1 half, we can modify in such a way that the expectation is equal to 1 under that new probability measure q. Uh, so that's our task. Uh, and the answer is, of course, we can do that. Why? Well, we have simply two unknowns, namely, uh, the probability of that event under the measure Q and the probability of that event. So there are two unknowns, but there are also two equations. Equation number one is that the expectation of X1 under this measure Q is equal to one. And the second condition is that it's a probability measure. So uh, the probability of that event and that event should, under that measure, should sum up to one. So by solving that uh, system of linear equations, you immediately find out that the new probability measure Q should assign to that event that x1 is equal to 2, the value 1 third. And uh, this probability measure Q um, of the event x1 is equal to 1 half should have the value 2 third. Why? So let's check. Uh, if this uh, choice uh, does the job. First of all, let's compute uh, the expectation. And you see, uh, 2 times the value 1 half, uh, 1 third is 2 third, plus 1 half times the value 2 third is 1 third, 2 third plus 1 third is 1, and this is actually uh, uh, indeed the value x naught. Moreover, it's clear it's a probability measure. And in particular, I can define the following uh, random variable, which I would like to denote by y. And it is defined uh, as a composition of two functions, namely this function 2 third times the indicator function of 2 plus 4, uh, 4 third times the indicator function of 1 half, composed with this random variable x1. And the first claim is that this random variable y under this probability measure p has expectation 1. And moreover, it holds that the expectation of uh, x1 under q equals to the expectation 
of x1 times y under the probability measure p. And that object we just computed. This is equal to x0 and this was the equal to 1. So let's check why that is true. So let's first compute the expectation of y under the probability measure p. So this is simply 1 half uh, times the value uh, 2 third because uh, with probability 1 half this random variable uh, x1 takes the value 2. So we pick up that indicator function then we get that value. So 1 half times 2 thirds is 1 third plus um, 1 half times um, 4 third is 2 third, 1 third plus 2 third is equal to 1. And let us check that second condition. Let us compute what is the expectation under this probability measure p of this product x1 times y. Well, so this is nothing else but uh, 1 half from that condition because both events have the probability one half. So one half times two times two third. So this is equal to two third plus one half times one half times four third. And you see this is equal to one third. And again, one third plus two third is equal to one. And indeed we have that equality. Well, that's just a trivial example, but uh, we would like to, uh, uh, to take that as a guiding principle in what follows now. And for that purpose, let me fix a probability space throughout that uh, um, video. So by omega fp, I denote my favorite abstract probability space. And the first notion I would like to introduce is the notion of absolutely continuous measures. So let me consider a finite measure which I denote by Q defined on my measurable space omega f. And then I say this measure Q is absolutely continuous with respect to this measure P and that's the shorthand notation for that. Um, if the following holds that any uh, P negligible set A implies that it's also a Q negligible set. Meaning that for any measurable set A, whenever the probability under the measure P of, the, uh, of this um, event A is equal to zero, it implies that also uh, the measure of that set A uh, with respect to this measure q is equal to zero. Let us have a look at uh, the example we have above and you immediately see that the distribution of um, uh, x under p and the di distribution of um, x under q has a property uh, to be absolutely continuous. Why? So see uh, this uh, so x for sure takes values in the reals so um, let us pick any um, uh, Borel measurable set which has p probability zero and you see this is any set you choose from the Borel sigma algebra over r which has a property that it does not contain the value 2 or 1 half, uh, it immediately follows that this, uh, the probability of that kind of event is zero. But you see also by that choice, it's also true that this is true for uh, with respect to this uh, probability measure Q by the construction we made uh, we make here because we only assign um, values to the event that x1 takes the value 2 uh, or x1 takes the value 1 half. So indeed, uh, the probability measure, uh, uh, so what's the distribution of the um, random variable x under p is absolutely continuous 
uh, or more precisely the distribution of x under the uh, probability measure q is absolutely continuous with respect to the distribution of x under the probability measure p. Uh, let me give you an example of a, uh, of a measure which is not absolutely continuous with respect to p. For instance, uh, choose um, as a finite measure the Lebesgue measure, let's say, on the interval, uh, let's say, 0 to uh, 3. And let me now pick um, any event uh, which has uh, um, a probability or which is p negligible, meaning I pick an event from the Borel sigma algebra such that the um, probability under this measure p is zero. And for instance, if I choose um, the interval, let's say from um, three quarter to five quarter. Then you see, if you consider then the distribution of x uh, under p and you um, plug into that measure this interval, which is, which is for sure Borel uh, measurable, uh, then you see the, this, uh, uh, the probability under this distribution is zero. However, the Lebesgue measure has the value um, uh, one half. So you see the Lebesgue measure is not uh, absolutely continuous with respect to the distribution of x under p. What are the consequences of absolutely continuous measures? Well, that's the, the statement of the following theorem, which uh, goes under the name radon nicotine. And for that, I consider a finite measure q defined on our, uh, on our measurable space omega f. And then the following holds true. This measure Q is absolutely continuous with respect to P, is equivalent um, to the following statement, namely that there exists an F measurable uh, random variable Y, which is non-negative and which has finite expectation under P, such that I can write the measure Q of any event A, taken from our sigma algebra F, as the expectation under P of uh, the product of the random variable Y with the indicator function of that event A. And this um, uh, random variable Y is called density or rather Nicodem derivative, and it is also denoted by this um, differential quotient of these kind of measures. But be aware of the fact that this is simply a symbol and it just denotes um, this kind of random variable y. Um, let me tell you something about the proof. The direction that A implies B is a little bit more involved and I would need a little bit more um, time to explain that here, that's why I decided to skip it. Um, however, I would like to um, give you a reference where you can find um, a probabilistic proof of that statement. For instance, have a look at the book of Cohn, that's a book on measure theory, and they find it uh, in theorem 4.2.2. Let us focus on the other direction. So we would like to check that uh, whenever we have given a um, measurable um, uh, function y, which is non-negative and has finite expectations, and I define this uh, set function q by uh, this expectation of y times the indicator function of uh, an event a for any a and f, uh, then indeed uh, q is a finite measure and moreover q is absolutely continuous with respect to p. 
So let's start checking that uh, this mapping is um, a measure. For sure, it takes values in uh, in the interval zero to infinity. Why? Well, y is non-negative and the indicator function is also non-negative, so this immediately implies that uh, this value is non-negative. Uh, in order to check that we have that q indeed is a measure, uh, we simply have to check that q is uh, sigma additive. And for that purpose, let us choose um, measurable sets a1, a2, and so on from the sigma algebra f, which we choose in such a way that they are mutually disjoint. And to uh, lighten notation, I would like to denote by capital A this uh, union of this events AI. So now let us compute um, as in this value Q of A. So by definition, it's nothing else but the integral over A of this random variable Y dP. And this I can also write as the integral over omega of the indicator function of a multiplied by y dp. Now we see what I can do. I would like to take advantage of the fact that a is the union of mutually disjoint uh, subsets uh, or events a taken from the sigma algebra f. So what I can do is I can and rewrite that indicator function as a series of, so an infinite sum of the indicator function uh, of the sets ai. Why? Well, if you take an omega, it can only be in one of these ais, and that's why you only get one value, uh, so once this, um, this uh, one times the value one, if omega lies in the union of uh, these sets AI. What I would like to do now is I would like to write this infinite sum as the limit of this partial sum going up to n. And then I can use, since this thing is a monotone function, the monotone convergence theorem, which allows me to take the limit out of the integral. So that's the first inequality sign. The next step is rather simple. Since this is now a finite sum, I can interchange it with the integral. So this I have done here. But now I can undo the steps which I have done in the, in the first place here. Namely, I rewrite the integral over omega of the indicator function of ai times y dp as the integral over ai of y dp. And then I use simply the definition. So this means that I have then got um, the limit as n tends to infinity of this partial sum uh, i from 1 to n of q of a i. And you see this I can also rewrite as this infinite sum. And in this way I have uh, shown that indeed this mapping q is a measure. And moreover if I plug in omega then you see from that representation over here uh, that you simply have to integ uh, integrate the random variable y with respect to the measure p. But by assumption, this thing is finite. Hence, this uh, measure q is a finite measure. What remains is to show that this measure q is absolutely continuous with respect to this probability measure p. And for that purpose, let us choose um, a measurable set A from our sigma algebra F such that the probability under this measure P of this event A is equal to zero. What does it imply? Well, it's, um, it implies that the indicator function of A is equal to zero P almost surely. And well, this y is non-negative, so I can also multiply that by this indicator function. And it also holds that this product of y times the indicator function of a is zero p almost surely. 
What are the consequences of this observation? Well, let us have a look at this expectation. Knowing that this random variable, namely the random variable y times indicator of a is equal to zero, immediately implies that also the expectation under p is equal to zero. And by definition, this was nothing else but the value of as the measure q of this event a. And by that we have proven that the measure q is absolutely continuous with respect to p. Here's a remark, um, namely um, concerning the density, this random variable y we have seen in the last theorem. And you see it is determined uniquely uh, by uh, the probability measure p and this finite measure q up to p null sets. What does it mean? Well, if I take a second uh, um, map uh, y prime, which has, which has a property that it is f measurable, and it satisfies the following relation, namely that for any event A from our sigma algebra F, it holds true that the expectation under P of Y prime times the indicator function of A is equal to Q of A. Uh, it's this event A. And um, what this uniquely determines refers to is the fact that the probability of the event that y is equal to y prime uh, under this measure p is equal to 1. Why is that true? Well, let us consider the event that y is strictly larger than y prime. For sure this is an, um, uh, an event from the sigma algebra of f due to the fact that uh, both random variables y and y prime are f measurable, meaning the difference between y and y prime is f measurable, and the event that the difference between y and y prime is strictly larger than zero is for sure a, a measurable set. So well, now let us have a look at the following expectation. So what is the expectation under this measure p of the difference between y and y prime multiplied by the indicator function of the event that y is strictly larger than y prime. Well, let us use the property of uh, this random variable y. If I use linearity, I can rewrite that expectation as the difference between two expectations, namely the expectation under p of y times the indicator function of the, this event minus the expectation of p uh, under p of the event y prime multiplied by the indicator function of that event. By definition, in both cases, we get q of this event. And then we, you see we have here q of the event that y is larger than y prime minus q of the event that y is larger than y prime. So in that way, we get that zero. But now let us have a look at um, this random variable over here. On the event that y is strictly larger than y prime, we know that this difference is positive. So we have here a positive random variable or non-negative random variable, more precisely, because that thing could be zero. Uh, and th the expectation of a non-negative uh, random variable is equal to zero implies that this random variable over here has to be zero p almost surely. Now you see on that event, we can divide by that difference because it's strictly positive under that event, you see. So that's, that immediately implies that the indicator function of y is larger than y prime has to be zero p almost surely. And this immediately implies that y um, has to be less than or equal to y prime p almost surely. Now you can 
interchange the roles of y and y prime and you can also prove that y prime is less than or equal to y p almost truly and from that you immediately deduce that uh, these densities y and y prime if you have two then they um, are the same with probability one so let us come back uh, to uh, to our example we had in the beginning. So we have seen that we can construct such a random variable y in a more general setting. What is left is, can we also find that kind of a representation? Namely, that the expectation of a f measurable random variable um, x1 under the measure q is the same as this uh, expectation of this product of x1 times y under the measure p. And that's exactly the statement of the following theorem. So let us assume that we have our probability, measure, um, uh, probability space omega fp and we have given a finite measure q and we assume that q is absolutely continuous with respect to p and then we know uh, there exists a density and we denote that density by y and consider a, a further a random variable x. So in case this random variable x is non-negative then it holds true that the integral of x dq is equal to the pr uh, expectation under this probability measure p of the product of uh, x and y. And the second statement is the following. If x is in L1q, uh, this holds true if and only if the product x times y is in L1p. And in that case, the following equality holds, namely, that the integral of x dq equals the expectation of the product of x times y under that measure p. Here uh, a remark on notations. Um, you have seen I use these bold face letters to denote probability measures. Wherever if I have a finite or sigma finite measure I simply would like to use this just this simple uh, um, capital letters P or Q. And moreover, I reserve this uh, symbol, the expectation, if I have here a probability measure, otherwise I write it as an integral. So you also see that thing you can write as an integral with respect to the probability measure, but that symbol of the expectation value I reserve for probability measures. Okay, since we have clarified notations. Let us have a look at the proof. And the proof is rather classical. Namely, it's this uh, measure theoretic induction, which we use here. So the first step is, suppose that the function x is um, a simple function. By assumption, we know also it's non-negative. Simple function means the following, that we can find um, non-negative um, reals and measurable sets uh, ai from our sigma algebra f such that we can write x as this finite linear combination of uh, this uh, coefficients ai and the indicator function of the set capital ai. Okay. For that choice, let us compute uh, the left-hand side, namely the integral of x dq. You see, if I plug in that definition over here, I simply get the sum i from 1 to n of a i times q of this uh, event a i. What we know from um, the theorem of um, uh, Radon Nicodym, that we that this measure Q of this event AI has the following representation 
in terms of the density y. Namely, I can also write it as the expectation with respect to p of uh, the indicator function of this event ai times this random variable y. And now I can simply use linearity of the expectation again to bring both the coefficient ai and this finite sum in, uh, into the expectation and then you see you get back this random variable x. And in that way we have proven this first statement for simple functions. The step two is the following. Whenever you give me an arbitrary random variable x uh, which is non-negative, then I can al always find a sequence uh, of simple functions which converge monotone uh, to our random variable x. So what does that uh, imply? Well, let us have a look at that integral. By using the monotone convergence theorem, I can um, first of all rewrite that x as a limit of xn, and then I can apply the monotone convergence theorem to bring this limit as n tends to infinity out of the integral. So now we have here exactly an integral of a simple function, so we can apply the result of step one, and we can rewrite that expectation, uh, that integral here as an expectation with respect to p of the product of the random variable xn times this random variable y. And now I use again the monotone convergence theorem because that product, so if xn is monotone, y is non-negative, this product here is also a monotone sequence. So I can now use again the monotone convergence theorem, bring this limit inside, and I exactly get what I wanted to, to prove, namely that this, this integral here is equal to the expectation with respect to p of the product of x times y. And you see, the second statement follows more or less from the uh, first statement simply by observing that we can decompose the random variable x into its positive and its negative part. And then we can apply the result of a to each of these two summons. And by that we immediately see that uh, this equivalence between this integrability condition holds true and we have also that formula. Well, let us come to a couple of examples and here is a, a rather trivial one. However, it eludes a little bit uh, the role of this radon nicotine derivative. So, Assume for a moment that our probability space, omega, which is usually some abstract space, uh, is just a countable set. And let us equip that countable set with the sigma algebra, which is given by simply the power set. And then I would like to consider a probability measure on that measurable space, omega f, which should have the property that the probability for any singleton taken, so meaning for any uh, set which consists only of one single element taken from our um, uh, countable set omega, this probability should have the uh, uh, property that it's strictly positive. And then the consequences are the following, that any measure you can imagine uh, or define uh, on our measurable space omega f is absolutely continuous with respect to p. Why is that true? Well, what are um, uh, measurable sets taken from the sigma algebra f which have the property that uh, under this measure p the, the probability of that event is zero. Well, it's the only choice is the empty set. 
But you see, the empty set uh, is also uh, has measure zero for any probability measure you can, or any finite measure, or even any measure you can think of. Now let us have a closer look at the density. So since we know that any probability measure uh, Q on omega f is absolutely continuous with respect to P, we know by the theorem of Radom Nicodem that there exists a density. And in this particular case, you see that symbol for the uh, Radom Nicodem derivative is actually a fraction. Namely, it's a fraction of the measure uh, q of omega divided by the, uh, the value of the measure p of omega. Why is that true? So let's check. So for that purpose, give yourself any event a from the sigma algebra f and consider the measure q of a. Well, uh, due to the fact that omega is countable, we can uh, rewrite, uh, use um, the uh, sigma additivity to rewrite the probability of under the measure Q of this event A as a sum of all omegas in A of Q of omega. And now let us do the following. I multiply and divide by P of omega. And you see in that way, I get exactly this random variable y, which we defined over here. And as a byproduct, I now has, have this reference measure p instead of this reference measure q before. And now you see, simply you can uh, write this summation over all omega in A as this summation over all omega and omega, if you include here an indicator function uh, of the uh, event that omega is contained in A. And in that way, you obtain um, that the measure Q of A can be written as the expectation under this measure P of this product between the indicator function of this event A and this random variable Y. So uh, let us go to the other extreme and um, now take as uh, our uh, um, set omega the open interval 0, 1. Let us choose for the sigma algebra simply the Borel sigma algebra over this uh, open interval 0, 1. And for uh, P, let us choose the Le Lebesgue measure. On that space, and you see, um, Indeed, the Lebesgue measure on the interval 0, 1 is a probability measure. And when you see um, a measure Q is absolutely continuous with respect to P, if that was a statement of the theorem, uh, of the theorem uh, 1.5, the Radon-Nicodem um, theorem, Let's exist a random variable mapping 0, 1 to 0, infinity with a property that if you integrate that measurable function with respect to our probability measure, meaning with respect to the Lebesgue measure, then you get 1. And you see you can write that um, uh, probability measure Q of an event A simply as the integral of, uh, over the set A of this density Y of omega d omega. And that's really the Lebesgue integral. Uh, let me here give you a remark uh, which will be important uh, to some extent later on when we focus on so-called conditional expectations. So for the moment, uh, consider two probability measures, which I denote by P and Q, defined on our measurable space omega f. And now omega f is just up some abstract space. And I would like to assume that Q is absolutely continuous with respect to P. Then by the theorem of Radon Nicodem, we know that there exists an f measurable random variable y, which is non-negative, 
And in this particular case, the expectation of y is equal to 1 under p, such that we can write q of a as the expectation of um, this product indicator function of a times y with respect to the measure p for any a and f. So that's just uh, ref the statement of rather negative. Now let us do the following. Suppose we consider a sub-sigma algebra f naught of our sigma algebra f. Um, for sure, also um, p and q are two probability measures on this smaller measurable space, namely omega equipped with the sigma algebra f naught. And it also holds true that um, p is absolute, uh, q is absolutely continuous with respect to p. Why? Well, um, we know by assumption that q is absolutely continuous, meaning that any uh, measurable set A from F uh, such that P of A is zero implies that Q of A is zero. And this in particular holds true if we take a smaller sigma algebra. So then we can again apply the uh, theorem of radon nicodym which tells us, well, there exists um, density Y naught, non-negative F zero measurable, such that we can write Q of A equal to the expectation of uh, this um, product uh, indicator function of A times Y0 under this probability measure P, but now for all A in F0. And in particular, it holds true that the expectation under P of Y indicator function A equals to the expectation under p of y naught uh, times the indicator function of a and this holds true for any a from the sigma algebra uh, f naught. However, in general, uh, these two densities y and y naught are not the same. And in order to see that, let us take an extreme case, namely that the sigma algebra f naught, which I have chosen here as a sub-sigma algebra of f, simply contains the empty set and the full space. In that particular case, you see immediately that the density is simply the constant function 1. Uh, and you, for sure, you can construct a density y which is uh, different from this constant function 1. So they has to be different in general. Let us come now to some consequences of um, the fact that two measures are absolutely absolute continuous with respect to each other. So for that purpose, I uh, assume that we have given two probability measures, Q and P, on our abstract probability space. Uh, or measurable space omega f, and I would like to assume that q is absolutely continuous with respect to p. Then it follows that the radon nicotium derivative uh, is positive, q almost surely, not necessarily uh, p almost surely. Why is that true? Well, uh, let us denote this um, uh, rather nicotine derivative again by this random variable y. Let us choose uh, a non-negative uh, random variable x and then let us compute the expectation of x under q. Well, by theorem 1.6, we know that this thing is the same as the expectation under P of the product of X times Y. Well, but you see, uh, we can also write that thing as the um, uh, product of um, uh, x times y times indicator function that y is strictly larger than zero. Why? Well, we know that y either takes 
is very strictly larger than zero or zero but if y is equal to zero then also this indicator function is zero so we have nothing changed by introducing that indicator function here so if you want to see it more clearly simply write um, the one which we have here as the sum of two indicator function namely that um, the indicator function of the event that y is strictly larger than zero plus the indicator function of the event that y is equal to zero and in the second case you see that what we are integrating over is equal to zero by that condition since we have that product here and this uh, simply implies that only that term survives but now we can again uh, apply the CRM 1.6 now to the random variable x multiplied by this indicator function that y is larger than zero so we get under this measure q um, uh, the expectation of x times indicator function that y is larger than zero well what to do with that equality well let us choose for x simply the following trivial random variable namely the indicator function of the event that y is equal to zero so if i plug that in then i get here the probability that y is equal to zero so this is the same as if i plug in here the indicator function but now you see um, there's no omega such that simultaneously the value is zero so the value of y is equal to zero and the value of y is strictly larger than zero. So this means that that thing is for that choice is equal to zero. So in re then we have proven that the probability under Q of that event that y is equal to zero is zero, meaning this random variable y takes only positive values with uh, Q almost surely. Well, let us come now to um, a new notion, namely what we understand under equivalent measures. So let us give now or consider now two probability measures on our measurable space omega f. And then we say that q is equivalent to p and that's the symbol for that. If the following holds true, namely that q is absolutely continuous with respect to p, and that p is absolutely continuous with respect to q meaning that any p negligible set uh, is all is, is equivalent to um, any q negligible set well what are the consequences of of this definition well first before coming to the next theorem let us go back for a moment to our first tiny example and you see in that example the measure p and q are um, equivalent because any uh, null set with respect to the distribution of x under p is a null set with respect to the distribution of x under q and vice versa So let us come now to the following um, statement. So again, I consider two probability measures defined on the measurable space omega f, and I assume that q is absolutely continuous with respect to p. Then the following holds true, namely that q is equivalent to p if and only if this random Nicodem derivative is strictly positive, but now p almost truly. And in this case, we have the following relation, namely that the um, rather negative derivative of uh, dp by dq is the same as the inverse of the rather negative derivative of dq by dp. Meaning, if q is absolutely continuous with respect to p, 
P we know by the theorem of Radon Nicodem that there is a density y. So that's this density y. And you see if P is absolutely continuous with respect to Q, then there is also a density called Z. And you see that Z and Y are in relation to each other, namely that Z is equal to the inverse of this random variable Y, meaning 1 over Y. Okay, let us have a look at that proof. So I would like to start with first proving um, this equality between the densities, assuming that P and Q are absolutely continuous. So what do we know? Well, since uh, P is absolutely continuous, uh, P and Q are equivalent to each other, then we know by the theorem um, of Radon Nicodem that there exists a density Y and a density Z, such that I can write Q as the expectation of um, y times the indicator function of an event A with respect to the measure P and vice versa. I can write P of an event A as the expectation under Q of this density Z times the indicator function of the event A. Moreover, by theorem 1.6, it holds true that for any um, non-negative measurable random variable X, the following holds, namely, that's, that's the expectation under P of this random variable X, I can express with the help of the density, and here I use that P is absolutely continuous with respect to Q, that I can write that expectation as the expectation under Q of the product Z times X. And now I use that Q is absolutely continuous with respect to P, this random variable z times uh, x is also non-negative because x is non-negative and z is non-negative um, as a consequence of the theorem 1.5. So I can rewrite that expectation as an expectation under P uh, of this product y times z times x. So I can solve now, uh, so bring that expectation on the other side, use linearity and can rewrite that equation over here as the equation that zero is equal to the expectation under P of this um, term y times z minus one multiplied by x. So now this holds true for any um, measurable non-negative random variable x. So let us choose now the indicator function um, that y times z is strictly larger than 1 as this random variable x. If we plug that in, we immediately see uh, that um, from that equation over here, that this event uh, y times z minus 1 times the indicator function that y times z is strictly larger than 1 is equal to 0. But under that event over here, we know that that uh, difference is uh, positive, meaning we have here an expectation of a positive random variable or non-negative random variable, which is equal to 0, meaning or implying that this random variable has to be zero p almost sure. And on that event here, again, that uh, uh, factor over here is strictly positive. So we can divide by that. So we are left with the indicator function of that event is zero p almost surely, which simply means that this product y times z is less than or equal to one p almost surely. And now we and do this uh, and do the same computation for choosing x equal to the indicator function that y times z is less than or equal to one and uh, in that way we obtain also that by the analog computation as we did here 
and we obtain that y times z is larger equal to zero uh, p almost surely and from that it follows um, that z has to be equal to that y times z is equal to one p almost surely and um, what we also know is that y is q almost surely positive but since uh, q and p are um, equivalent to each other it also implies that uh, y is p almost surely uh, positive that's why i can divide by y and i get exactly that relation and uh, using again the fact that p and q are equivalent it also holds true that this equality uh, is satisfied q almost surely so by that we have proven that statement over here what we are left with uh, is this first statement namely to show that the equivalence between p and q is um, uh, equivalent to the fact that uh, q is absolutely continuous with respect to p and that this radon nicodem derivative is strictly positive p almost surely so let us first show the backward direction so we assume that q is absolutely continuous with respect to p and that the density is positive p almost surely what we want to do is we want to show that p is absolutely continuous with respect to q so let us use in the first step um, lemma 1.7 and this tells us first of all that y is positive q almost surely well how does that help well now let us compute the expectation of y to the minus one times x so we know that thing is q almost truly positive so we can uh, compute uh, the expectation of that product under the measure q well and you we, we do not change anything if we introduce here the event that um, y is strictly larger than zero because we know that this event here occurs with probability one so and now i would like to apply theorem uh, 1.6 so this allows me to rewrite that expectation over here in terms of the expectation with respect to p but then i get in addition this random variable y and now you see this y and the y one over y cancel each other so i am simply less left with the expectation with respect to this measure p of this product of x times the indicator function that y is strictly larger than um, zero but now by assumption we also know that uh, y is strictly larger than zero p almost surely this simply means that i can um, simplify that expectation or this simplifies to the, simply the expectation of x with respect to this measure p and this computation holds true for any x which is non-negative and measurable so in particular we obtain from um, that uh, from that equality over here uh, if we plug in for uh, x simply the indicator function of an event a that's the probability of a so this we get from here is equal to the expectation of uh, y to the minus one times the indicator function of a uh, and the expectation is with respect to q this we get from that side well what can we conclude from that so our goal is to show that um, whenever we have uh, that p is absolutely continuous with respect to q so what should we do we pick an event from the sigma algebra f such that uh, this event a has a measure zero under q so what does it imply this implies that the indicator function of a 
is equal to um, uh, zero uh, Q almost truly. And uh, I think here's a type, which should be y to the minus one. I can multiply that thing with y to the minus one. Then it's always also true that this product is equal to zero Q almost truly. And then I can consider the expectation of that uh, um, a random variable over here. Since we know that this thing is zero Q almost truly, we also know that this expectation is zero, but by definition, this was simply the probability of A. And in that way, we have proven that P is absolutely continuous with respect to Q. Mind, here are two typos. This should be Y and this should be Y. So now let us do a proof the other direction. So we assume that uh, P is equivalent to Q and we would like to show that uh, this, ren this density Y um, has a property uh, defined in that way has a property that it's um, positive P almost surely. Well, uh, how to do that? Well, since uh, P and Q are absolutely con uh, equivalent to each other, this means that there exists a density y and a density z given by these radon nucleodium derivatives. So that's our goal. Well, what we know uh, by lemma 1.7 is that um, y is uh, positive q almost truly. Well, since y is positive q almost surely, uh, and we know, uh, so you see here is a shortcut, and since y is, uh, since q and y are absolutely continuous and they're equivalent to each other, we also know that this thing holds true p almost surely, and we are done. Here I would like to give you a slightly different argument. Namely, I would like to consider, uh, so we know by the computation we did before, that uh, this, uh, there's, a, there's a relation between the uh, density z and the density y, namely that z is equal to y to the minus 1 p almost joule and q almost joule. So this we have shown in that part over here. Well, what we get from that? Well, let us compute now the expectation uh, under P of the event that um, uh, of, the, of this uh, random variable X times the indicator function that Y is larger than zero. So this we can um, also write uh, in the following form, namely by multiplying and dividing by uh, y. And since we are on that event that y is strictly positive, we have no problem. Now I would like to apply CRM 1.6, which allows me to rewrite that expectation in terms of the expectation with respect to q. Doing so, I um, uh, get rid of that uh, random variable y here because it was exactly the density of uh, um, which I need to go from p to q and that's this non-negative random variable I'm interested in. So then I get exactly that expression over here. But now we know um, under q that we can rewrite that y to the minus one as that and then we can, uh, then we have simply here the following expression, namely that um, uh, the expectation of, um, with respect to Q of Z times X times this indicator function. But mind that we already know that uh, P almost surely Y is, uh, Q almost surely Y is positive. Hence, we can also get rid of that indicator function. And now I again apply CRM 1.6 and now you see um, 
I get rid of this density because it's absorbed in that P. And what I get back here is simply the expectation of X with respect to P. And that holds true for um, any um, uh, non-negative random variable X. In particular, it holds true for X equal to 1. And then you see if you plug in here one, so you get here one. This one um, you can forget about. And then what is left here is the probability of the event that y is strictly larger than zero. And you have proven that indeed y is p almost surely positive.